we help separate the complexity of what to write and the writing of it. And the fundamental, universally applicable tool in that is the keyword outline. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, I want to talk today with you about another category of learning differences. And I'm not sure everybody actually understands that this could be classified as a learning difference. Well, I'm guessing that it would fall under that kind of title of exceptional children. Yes. And and there is an, a national council for exceptional children. They do conferences. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they put together kids with kind of special needs, special circumstances that would make learning harder. Right. But they also include kids who are in the kind of what we used to call gifted and talented right. zone. I don't know. Is that what they still call it? That's what we're calling it today. Okay. And maybe with apologies if we are not using the right term today, but we are talking about gifted and talented. And it reminds me of one of my favorite Disney animated movies, actually Pixar did, The Incredibles. And there's a scene in there where Dash, he's the one that can go really, really fast. He says to his mom, but dad says, we're special. And mom says, Dash, everyone's special. And Dash says, which means no one is. <laughs> mm. And, you know, it's 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 one of those painful truth things. You know, what do you do with a gifted and a talented student who you know has been gifted with certain abilities and our culture just kind of wants to make everyone the same, that egalitarian myth? And can we just start right there? What is your experience with the egalitarian myth and what does that even mean? Well, you know, it kind of goes back to conversations we've had about, say, John Gatto's Mm -hmm. explaining of education, the changes that happened from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s, and then Oliver DeMille kind of labeling that change in education to be the the Soviet conveyor belt, Hmm. so that it's Soviet in that it's non-optional because we had compulsory school attendance for a very long time until home school freedoms started to arise in the late 1900s. And also that idea that you could take a group of children and have them do the same thing in the same way according to the same schedule to get the same result. And that kind of conveyor belt system or conveyor belt way of thinking about education was what came in and has kind of reached its completion. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and I think most people in education have come to the conclusion that just doesn't work. No. I talk about this a little bit in my talk, However Imperfectly. Mm. And uh, it's a great talk. People can listen to the whole thing or read the essay that is um, a summary of the talk, where this idea that one of the things that I realized, kind of a duh, Mm -hmm. like as soon as you say it, everybody agrees, Mm -hmm. but nobody operates as though it's true. Mm -hmm. All children are different. They are different. And in in our space, we hit, you know, in schools in Mm -hmm. particular, but in the homeschool and hybrid school world as well, Uh, we do come up against that problem of teachers know this, but the system doesn't accommodate for that Mm -hmm. too well until kids get a label. 
Right. And once they get a label, then all sorts of things can be different. Mm -hmm. So when you can label a kid learning different or whatever you want to sub-labels, right. dyslexic, ADHD, spectrum, and we've talked about a lot of that, now you're allowed to do something differently. It's the whole idea of differentiated instruction. Okay. That would be a term familiar to any teachers out there who work in that area. Mm -hmm. The idea being, oh, well, since these kids are different, well, we should be able to do something different right. with them. Right. And that gives the, the special ed branches of school districts mm -hmm. a whole lot more freedom mm -hmm. to choose curriculum, to adjust things, to not worry as much about the dictates from the state or the district. Of course, then we run into the problem of labeling children. Exactly. Now, on the other end, you've got kids who fall into the it's easier to learn rather mm -hmm. than harder to learn mm -hmm. and probably get bored in school mm. even faster. Yeah. I don't know if I ever told you this, but I might have been labeled gifted because I skipped second grade. Mm -hmm. So we moved and I was in first grade and I guess we moved over the summer. That mm -hmm. would be my guess. I mean, I was only six years old. And then at the new school, they put me into third grade. Hmm. So I never went to second grade. And I don't recall that I ever had a problem with any of the academic stuff, right. you know, reading, writing, doing math, spelling. That was always pretty easy. I find it fascinating, Andrew, that so many similarities between us growing up in Southern California, dad's engineered, sailboats. I skipped eighth grade. You skipped eighth grade. I did. Well, now the funny thing there is I did eighth grade twice. Oh, no. <laughs> well, what happened in my case was I was a year you know, ahead of everyone. And when I got to high school, I was a year younger. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was hell. I hated it so, so much. I would just sit around and daydream about ways to just mm. escape. I, I even convinced the high school counselor with the ink blot test that I was profoundly like depressed and even suicidal. I came up with the darkest, awfulest possible ink blot responses that any intentionally because I wanted out of the school and I didn't care. So I actually went to a private school for eighth grade, a second time. That was mm -hmm. the best year of my life. Sure. You know, I loved it. Yeah. And then when I went back to that same school, I I survived. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that is interesting. Yes. So did you graduate high school a year earlier than everyone else? Mm -hmm. Oh. So, you know, I, I don't know. They didn't have, as far as I remember, any gifted and talented program that I participated in. Although I think they tended to divide kids into classes a certain way, but it was all invisible. Sure. Well, this so, was a long time ago, Andrew, as much as we hate to admit it. It was a very long time. It was time. a very long time ago. <laughs> but um, now, of course, you know, uh, there's so much more mm -hmm. understanding of this and definitions and categories. So right. what what is the definition of giftedness. I mean, you did a little research on this. I did. So according to the National Association for Gifted Children, giftedness is students with gifts or talents. They perform or have the capability to perform at higher levels compared to others with the same age, experience, or environment in one or more domains. So, you know, they can come from all backgrounds and ethnicity or economic. They just, of you know, they got more stuff in their brain and they're able to do things more easily. Yeah. And it probably usually surfaces in early reading. Yes. That would be my guess because most schools, uh, their primary concern is at what level are kids reading. Right. That, and that's where a tremendous amount of energy is focused. So if you've got kids that are reading well, particularly mm -hmm. in the early grades, it, it's almost a real problem for a teacher right. because what do you do with a child who can read everything 
and you're busy teaching other people how to read basic things. Right, right. Yeah, uh, were you reading before you attended school? I'm pretty sure. I, I don't ever remember learning to read. Yes. I, I, I feel like I always knew how to read. I was reading very young, and so I was very bored in kindergarten, yeah. and I memorized the alphabet backwards. Oh, Z-Y-X-W-V-U-T-S-R-Q-P-O-M-L-K-J-I I almost yeah, did it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because my dad taught me to read. Yes. And why not? Well, because now I was bored in school. So I thought from that same website, the... National Association of Gifted Children, I'd like to just touch on some myths about these gifted children. So, and just see if you have any comments about that. And then I want to go into challenges that they may face and how, of course, structure and style can help students who are gifted, and teachers of students who are gifted and talented can use our writing method to help them grow yeah, in this area. Absolutely. How they can make accommodations, as you say. <laughs> so myth number one, gifted students don't need help. They'll be fine on their own. Well, I would think um, anyone who spent any time with kids whose brains work really fast, in a way, they need as much in terms of scaffolding, support, structures, as the child who struggles with it. So, you know, I can definitely see that. Otherwise, they just kind of go wild, mm -hmm. like explode in different directions. And then how do you pull them back in and help them focus on the thing that you're doing right. rather than the incredible new idea that they just have? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So myth number two, teachers challenge all students. So gifted kids will be fine in the regular classroom. Well, in an ideal circumstance, that would be true. And at risk of possibly offending someone, I'm just going to say it. When I first met um, Ingham and Webster, mm -hmm. you know, they're very old school. They mm -hmm. were teaching. In the 30s and 40s. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, 1930s and, and 40s. And so, <laughs> you know, as as Mrs. Ingham was designing the Blended Soundsight program of learning to teach, you know, first graders how to read and write, and Webster was expanding on that in the writing program, they were continuously talking about how you would filter kids into mm -hmm. different levels of challenge, affectionately referring to them as the birdies and the grunters. Mm -hmm. But in a in a affectionate way, just understanding that in any group of children, some are going to need accelerated opportunity challenges, information to stay engaged, and others are going to need more repetition at a slower pace, and maybe a little more direct help. But that was of that was kind of in a different time period mm -hmm. where, yeah, teachers had to deal with it. You know, Webster's first teaching job was in a one-room schoolhouse. If I recall, he said 47 students, and six of the first graders were Ukrainian refugees from World War II who did not speak English. Wow. And he had, you know, kids from 6 to 16 all in one room. That was his first classroom job. And so, you know, there there's that tradition of okay, we got a whole bunch of kids, they're all at different levels in everything. How do we help them individually? Yes. But that one room schoolhouse model was gradually eclipsed mm -hmm. by the age segregated grade level classroom model where everyone was doing the same thing mm -hmm. at the same time, according to the same schedule. So, you know, it seems as though maybe once upon a time, teachers could do that. But now, given the, the dynamics and expectations, it is much harder. Yes. Yes. The Age segregated classrooms, I think, is a huge contributor to some of the challenges that these students use. Because myth number three is gifted students make everyone in the class smarter by providing a role model or a challenge. Well, again, that would be theoretically, they could raise the level of language use and intellectual engagement and enthusiasm. But when you age segregate kids, mm -hmm. suddenly if they're all the same age, they're all the same rank in life, mm -hmm. it's just uncool yep. to be different. It's uncool to be better 
it's also uncool to be behind. Mm -hmm. So if everyone wants to have a good relationship, they kind of have to all sink down to the lowest common level. And I think that sometimes, you know, those kids who could go a lot faster and could be that example of an engaged, excited, competent student, they they semi-consciously just dumb themselves down so they fit in. Right. And yep. so that would be, you know, kind of a sad circumstance. Yep. Either that or they just get so bored they become a behavior problem, attracting attention to themselves and driving everybody else crazy and being hated for it. Which leads us to another myth. I'm not doing all of them. In the interest of time, I'm sure, just skipping sure. them. That student can't be gifted. They are receiving poor grades. Well, you know, I think we can very clearly look at many examples of students who were bored because of intelligence mm -hmm. and started to just not care. Right. And, and I think that's even more likely in today's world they, than, say, it was in my generation. Mm -hmm. I, I cared about good grades and doing well because my parents cared. Yes. And so there was a lot of emphasis on that. I'm sure there was with your parents mm -hmm. as well. Today, uh, I think, you know, it's sad but true that large numbers of parents are just not as engaged at all in their knowing what their kids are doing at school, knowing how they're doing, and helping solve some of those challenges and problems. Um, but we're definitely preaching to the choir here because the parents that we are talking to today sure. are not those parents. They you know, absolutely and the teachers care. we're talking to mm -hmm. are wishing the parents would be, mm -hmm. you know, more involved. Yep. And and that's why I think organizations like this mm -hmm. exist. Yep. Is to help teachers and parents get the information they need to be more involved and help overcome some of these myths so they can truly serve that gifted child. Okay, so some of the types of challenges gifted students face, can we just segue to that yeah, a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I just have a short list, and this list came from the Davidson Academy website, and this is an educational facility. They say some of the most common problem areas for gifted children include the following, and it's a shopping list here. Okay. Sensitivities and overexcitabilities. Well, I think any child can be vulnerable to that. Mm -hmm. The point would be that gifted kids are not immune. Exactly. Yep. Social skills. Every child struggles with social skills, especially in today's modern world. Yep. And gifted kids are not immune. Whether they're more likely to have issues in that area, I don't know. But I think the maybe it's a myth that because they can do schoolwork more easily, they must do everything more easily. They can pick up on social skills really easily or yeah. whatever. But it's also that stigma that you were talking about just a minute ago. If you were too smart, then you're going to be ostracized yeah. because you're making other people feel less smart, I suppose. Yeah. Perfectionism. Oh, we see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. I wonder if this is more of an occurrence today. Hmm than it was in the past. Hmm. I don't know for sure, but I suspect that in the category of parents who care, there is a greater likelihood of semi or subconsciously creating that mm -hmm. you should do everything perfect. Because mm -hmm. kids will translate do my best into being perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there's a gap there. So, you know, we as teachers and parents have to always realize it's great to strive, but no one is going to be perfect 100% of the time. And that's just, a, it's a hard lesson to learn. Sure. I do wonder if our modern, I don't know, kind of hyper achievement trend mm -hmm. that you see in some ways isn't contributing to that. Sure. Perfectionism category. Yeah, exactly. My mind has got two voices in it. One is my 10th grade English teacher who said to me, good enough isn't. isn't. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, it's it, it's very fitting now that, that I now work for the Institute for Excellence in Writing because we do strive for excellence. Right. But I also have another voice in my head, and this was my mentor in my MBA program, that said, Julie, B equals MBA. You don't have to get an A in every class. Yeah. And 
Um, well, and there's also the idea that perfection is the enemy yeah. of good. Yes. Like if, if you're so obsessed with perfection, you, you can't do anything. Yep. I mean, I've, I've watched children struggle for so long to make a word look hmm. perfect. Like penmanship-wise? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and okay, that's nice that they care, but when you have to erase and rewrite and erase and rewrite and erase and rewrite and it's still not good enough to make you happy, well, that's preventing you from writing anything else. Yep. So yep. there is that problem that perfectionism can impede actual progress. Exactly, exactly. So let's move this now over to our structure and style writing method, our easy plus one idea. How can we filter students in a classroom? Go Andrew Poudoua. Sure. Well, you know, when we do our professional development Mm -hmm. for teachers, we always do include a conversation about the idea that even though you've got 20, 30 kids who are in the same grade, there will still be quite a range of aptitude in reading, writing, and, you know, pretty much everything, but writing in particular. And that doesn't mean that they haven't all been taught well. I mean, Mm -hmm. you could assume they were taught well, or they were all taught poorly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they (laughs) came from the same previous classrooms, Mm -hmm. right, if they're in a school, but there's still that aptitude. So so we have this idea that now they should all do the same assignment, mm-hmm. which would require them to do the same length, require them to use the same source text, require them, and this is where I think, you know, is most dangerous, is require them all to do the same checklist. And then what happens is some kids do it pretty easily, and they're like, okay, what's next? I'm ready. But you're not ready for them. So, okay, go read a book or go do some busy work or go do something else or just leave me alone. And then you've got some kids who are really kind of overwhelmed. So the first thing we would say is, well, number one, you can customize the checklist. Right. You can take your top few kids and say, hey, I'm not going to show this to everyone because this isn't easy for them, but I see that it's easy for you. So here's the next style technique. You can secretly add it to your checklist and try it out in this next assignment. Well, and I I just have to mention this because we may have some brand new listeners here that do not know about our premium membership and what's included in there, which is our checklist generator so that you can actually customize them for your gifted and talented and those that aren't quite yeah. so. You could also just write onto whatever you checklist write, you're yes. using the next thing. Right, exactly. Um, and then you can go, you know, to some of the students and say, you know, I think this is maybe feeling a little overwhelming and just cross off a couple things right. from the checklist and say, you just stick with these three things. Don't worry about the rest of it. And you tell me when when this is easy. Right. And then we'll start adding them in again. Right. And so, that doesn't mean that that gifted and talented student is now scored, he could get an A and the highest the other student could get would be a C. It's not like that no, at all. No, 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 because, just, well, with our approach, if you do 100% of what's on the checklist, you get 100% right. on the assignment. Exactly. And, you know, as we've talked about before, the the ideal there, I think, is it's either A, which is 100%, meaning accomplished or accepted, or I, meaning incomplete, you're not finished, you need some help. If if you can't do that for some reason, well, then you could assign percentage base, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, if someone has 10 things and they miss one, okay, they get 90. If someone has seven things and they miss none, well, they'd actually have 100, you yeah, know, so exactly. you could do it that way. Another idea is this idea that everyone should do the same number of assignments. Mm -hmm. Now, this gets a little bit dicey because we do have this egalitarian Mm -hmm. idea that it wouldn't be fair to make someone do more work than someone else. But, you know, in kind of an ideal classroom, if someone needs more time to finish something and someone doesn't need 
that much time. Well, why not give them another source text, kind of an off the record chance to practice their skills and do it? And you know what I've found is that most of the kids who find it pretty easy find it enjoyable enough that they're willing to say, "Okay, yeah, I'll do an extra one." Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Webster even had, and Mrs. Ingham had this idea too the 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 reading pathway Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and so she would put a little poster on the wall with a stairway or something and every time one of her little grade one students finished a little book that little figure of the student with their name on it would go up a step Mm -hmm. and so yeah everybody's at a different place on the on the stairway but you're not comparing kids that way. It's just, okay, they're, you're making progress. Webster had the same idea for writing assignments. Like when you complete a writing assignment, you move uh, on your little pathway there. And it's okay to move faster than someone else in the room. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, that some people kind of bristle at that idea now. But... I don't know that any of the kids ever got either too prideful or too depressed. I, I mm-hmm. think, you know, it's it's kind of like life, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you get a job. Some people move up a little faster than others. I go to the gym. Some people gain <laughs> progress a little faster than me. And mm-hmm. what what is – there's no reason for me to be either prideful or depressed, mm-hmm. It's where I am. It's mm-hmm. reality. Yep, yep. And uh, so maybe, you know, that idea of adjusting the checklist, the number of assignments, and even to some degree, the the complexity of the source text. Sure, sure. Um, you know, we include in our history-based writing lessons a link to a file that has similar but slightly easier to read source text. Mm-hmm. So, and we also include in many of ours, not all theme based books, advanced editions. So, the checklist is a little bit harder. We've added exactly. a few more stylistic techniques for the yeah. students to play with. So, you know, I think that a teacher can, can handle this well, and it may be different than what kids are used to in other classes or other circumstances. Mm-hmm. But I think there is an honesty to that, that at their soul level, they'll be okay with. Well, and one of the reasons why I think this is totally possible, and you've kind of alluded to it already, is that the core of what we do is teacher training. Because it's not just curriculum, it's the teachers know how to make adjustments for those students that need something easier or something they need more of a challenge. I think of the the problem with students being bored in the classroom. Well, yeah. maybe they're bored because you're not a very exciting teacher. No, it's probably because they're not being challenged and they want to be challenged. Yeah. And so we want our teachers, whether they're a homeschooling parent or whether they're a classroom teacher, to go through our teacher training so that they can learn the method and they can make adjustments accordingly we often say, don't allow our curriculum to dictate what it is you're teaching your students. And in my talk on um, mastery learning, I do kind of make the statement that whatever book you're using, textbook, workbook, worksheets, whatever you've got, it's really only going to work as well as you. Like, it's not going to teach the kids. Mm -hmm. And so if it's going too fast... You've got to slow it down, put in more practice, you know, put in, add more help, add more example, whatever it is. If it's going too slow, well, then create the opportunity where you can speed it up and make it a little more challenging. I I think my most frustrating thing was math Mm. because I would just do the math and I didn't need the teacher to explain the stuff. (laughs) And then I could have done, you know, the next lessons but the teachers very often would say, don't work ahead in your math book. Okay, don't work ahead in your math book. Well, what am I supposed to do? Just sit here. Well, if, you, if you're if you finished and you have time, read. Okay, so, you know, I get to do extra read. It. Well, what's the crime of getting to do extra mm-hmm. math? Well, what it means is that the teacher would have to adjust to this idea that you could have 
kids at a dozen different places in the math book. Right. And that's just a, com- it's a different logistics. Mm-hmm. It's a different classroom management. Right. And most people aren't, learn- they haven't learned to do that. Doesn't mean it can't be done. And that's the way all the one-room schoolhouse teachers did it yep. way back when. Well, and to that point, do you recommend teachers, and I think I know the answer to this, they've got a spectrum of students. Do you recommend that they have the students go in different units? So you've got some in, still in unit one and two and some in unit five, or do you keep them together in the units and adjust the checklist? Yeah, Webster's idea, and I think it it is the best way to go, is everyone's in the same unit. Yep. And if you're going by the unit a month schedule, Mm -hmm. then, okay, it's October. We're all going to do unit three. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to do the first story, everyone together, make the keyword outline. Okay. The next story, okay, let's talk about it. Maybe make the keyword outline, but now do more on your own. The next story, okay, you've got the hang of it. Try it on your own. But if you need help, let me know. I'll come over and help you. You know, and then if you have one more, well, maybe you've got the kid who already did it while you were talking Okay, well, here's an extra story. Here's another one from my secret file Mm -hmm. of interesting source text. Exactly. uh, That you can have while I help the other people who are not doing this as fast as you are. And then end of the month, okay, we're done with unit three, unit four. So within the unit, you can customize both the checklist and the number of assignments and possibly even the challenge of the source tech, the reading level of the source tech. Right, but stay in the same unit. I would recommend that, yeah. Great. Okay, well, I think we have given our listeners food for thought and perhaps an argument to consider. Structure yeah, and style I, actually can work for these students. I, I want to say one more sure. thing in this regard, just because of the sheer number of people mm-hmm. who say this to me. My child can tell a story That's so amazing. He can tell you stuff, but when I ask him to write it down, he can't. Mm -hmm. And they don't quite understand why. Mm -hmm. They would equate the idea of being able to think of stuff with the skill of being able to write the stuff. And then they don't get the, the gap. And I think those kids who have that facility with language the vocabulary, the imagination, the memory, all of the components that would allow them to to write well, but they can't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because their brains are so fast. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've said, you know, a hundred times is, you know, this child's brain is faster than their hands. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges I think of kind of the gifted, imaginative, high language aptitude kid is they don't know how to slow down Mm -hmm. their brain. Yes. And then I explain that what we do is we help separate the complexity of what to write and the writing of it and the, the fundamental universally applicable tool in that is the keyword outline. Mm hmm. And as soon as those kids get that keyword outline, now they can shift into the task that isn't as easy for them, which is the putting of words into sentences and the mechanics and spelling and proofreading what you wrote and all of all of that stuff, because they already know what they're going to say and write, and they don't have to hold that all in their memory at once. So... You know, that's uh, very often, as soon as I explain, if you separate the complexities, then it's easier. People get it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they come back a year later and tell me their success story, et cetera. Love it. Well, thank you, Andrew. Very helpful. Yeah. Interesting topic. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at iew.com slash podcasts. 
Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.